Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions and today I'm delighted to be joined by John Gill. Well, delighted by the fact that, you know, if you didn't turn up, John, then I'd have to speak and so, you know, nobody wants that. <laughs> today, like, this is, this is a point because John has produced basically a series of videos for us at, at CDN, and they're they're loosely linked to the work that we did around digital skills and competencies. Um, but specifically, it's addressing that specific skill of using the video to do deliver the curriculum in a variety of ways. And John is helpfully having worked in this area for years, although we're of a similar age. <laughs> <laughs> we worked there for years professionally in this medium. So he's taken the time to create eight videos that will give the best tips and tricks for you to get the best out of video. And that covers everything from presenting to collecting evidence to recording content. So, John, tell us more. Well, will we start with the intro? That's a good place to start. Absolutely. So I'm gonna. I'm. This is the uh, the first in the series, and then I'll go into a little bit about why and how I uh, I produce them. Um, but let's optimize that. Here we go. I've showered. I've got dressed, and I've even tidied up, and I'm ready to share with you my top tips for presenting to an audience online over video. My name's John Gill. I'm a filmmaker based in Fife, Scotland. And like the majority of the planet, most of my 2020 was spent in this box. It's not something that I'd done an awful lot before, so I've had to learn like everybody else. And hopefully some of that learning will be helpful to you. Of course, if the time spent in this box is for a living, you want to be comfortable you want to know that your audience is comfortable. And so I've got some quick tips to simplify things for you, but also I've got some deep dives for those who want to take it to the next level, maybe even buy some extra kit. So the two main points will be the tech and the presentation. These videos are mostly going to be about the tech, but I also have some tips that I've picked up myself that have been helpful to me, and hopefully they'll be helpful to you too. So we'll be covering sound, and video. Would you be surprised if I said sound was the most important? Probably not, because when you think about it, video can be distorted, it can be pixelated. If the audio is good, then you'll stick with the video. But if it's the other way around, if the audio, if the audio is crackly, if it's muffled, if it's quiet, then you've lost your audience. They might still be in the room, but they just won't be paying attention. So in these videos, we'll be looking at mics, lights and cameras and how we can best use them together to provide the best experience possible. So I hope these videos are helpful to you. Please get in touch with CDN if you have any other questions. Let's get into it. OK, so like Kenji said, there's a series of is it eight or nine? I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and um i suppose it came out of we'd been talking about you know like i just said there we've, we've all been online and um it's completely different uh experience my the first couple of workshops i did uh, i i just took my face-to-face -face model and delivered it online and spent all day online with people and very quickly realized it's exhausting and so you was just modifying what I was doing in order to be able to keep working. Um, and I suppose the turning point was I saw an article on LinkedIn by Sarah Gershman, who is a uh, she's a public speaking coach in New York, and she'd written a post for the Harvard Business Review about how to zing. Uh, no, how not to zone out on Zoom, zinging on Zoom. That's my thing. Um, but she'd written this post, how, how to not zone out on Zoom. And it was really about how, as a, an audience member, you could prepare yourself. And it was, and it just kind of flipped everything on its head for me. So 
I started thinking about right. Well, I, 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 I it would be um, not ideal to send this to all of my participants. So how do I frame this so that I can have them ready and prepared for for workshops? And a lot of it was just the kind of stuff that I also needed to do as a way of uh, preparing myself as a as a host, as a presenter, and just making it as engaging as possible. And so just taking a variety of these tips some of them are practical things so having a good light so people can see you having a decent mic so people can hear you without having sort of horrible echoes and um but then uh, you know part of it is engagement as well so i was interested to see a report just in the last couple of weeks about how allowing people to have their cameras turned off can increase engagement so we're still we're still learning and i, and I don't think online presenting for me as a, as a small business it's never going to go away you know it's opened the floodgates now i've got no boundaries as to where my audience is um and it's more ethical than me you know flying from scotland down to reading for three days to do one workshop when i can just do it from my, my sort of office at home so John, how did you find that when you transferred to online, what what were the significant sort of changes that you made? What was what was different? Like, how did you have to change your delivery? Because you you've packed those eight videos with quite a lot of tips. So I suppose the first thing was just condensing the information. Um, so my workshops face to face typically were a day long, and they would be a mix of delivery demos and then people going off and and completing a task for 30 40 minutes so people were up and about they weren't just sort of sat down all day um so i had to find a way of taking all these elements and making them work together so typically i would convert workshops into two or three hours and into a series of chapters so we might a day workshop might then take three weeks of two hours but in between there would be a uh, practical work that people could do at home um some of it was while we we're online as well but you know having that variety just getting people up and about so the the the, the temptation is too is too big you know especially when you've got other things that you could be doing um the temptation is too high just to do that email or to reply to that text or even just sit with netflix on in the background because who's going to know um so so people need even more of a reason you know once you've taken all those social conventions that are built into a room you know you're at a conference you're listening to somebody and you'd much rather be somewhere else but you know embarrassment as much as anything keeps you in that seat because you don't want to be the one walking out in front of everybody else and on zoom you you haven't got that luxury so you have to work harder to to keep people engaged but equally i think it's good that if people do want to just get up and go and make a drink and then come back that they can do that so it's just making it flexible enough to do do all of that stuff and then thinking about the the eight videos that you've produced <clears throat> so you're a filmmaker you're a professional filmmaker hey i attended your your screening in dundee of of the, the documentary <laughs> that you made on a mobile which which i thought was astounding um and and you have a lot of experience in this area so if i'm coming to your videos what what am i going to expect do um, am i going to be a filmmaker at the end of it please say yes please say yes um like <laughs> really technically like, pretty switched on when it comes to all the kit you're going to talk about i mean what what, what am uh, i going to get from these videos yeah well it's 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 a mix because so i'm a mobile filmmaker which is quite different to a traditional filmmaker. Um, a lot of the principles are the same, but essentially I'm using a mobile device. Um, so here's my sort of typical rig, right? So I've got a tripod, I've got a little tripod at the minute, it could be a bigger tripod, um, but then the grip is holding the phone. I've got an ND filter on the front to get um, sort of better sort of, shutter speeds in in sort of bright light out, outdoors um i've got a dedicated external mic which even you know while well, we've got two meter distance in still getting really good quality uh that's that's my sort of standard but the videos 
you know you can go to that level but equally you can just pick up your phone like one of the tips um, is I've got a I think in one of the videos I show uh, my my phone being propped up by an elastic band which is wrapped around a baked bean tin you know so even if you haven't got a tripod you know as long as you've got the phone and it's pointing at you and you're reasonably lit and that might just mean sitting in front of a window so you've got natural light coming in then you can record you can self shoot and then i mean it's not in the videos but there are apps you can get that you can chop that up very easily and edit on your phone and share from your phone so you just need one device so there's no sort of you know excessive amounts of cables or even wi-fi for that matter um you know you're not transferring to another device or using any fancy software it's just really sort of convenient and i think the the last the last sort of numbers i saw was that two-thirds of the people on the planet have a mobile phone a smartphone so chances are you've got a device very nearby that means you could make the kind of videos that i made to show you how to make the videos and and it, and it, you know before we know it's like sort of inception levels of, of depth but you know it, it's it's doable it's possible and and yeah there's a spectrum of you know this is entry level stuff you can just put the phone in front of you and record and edit um and hopefully the uh we, we you know we, we we sort of talk a lot about using laptops as well because most people are using laptops for, for the presenting side of things but um but there are things where you know if you're if you're uh, creating resources for students or even if you want to encourage your students to capture evidence while while things are still remote to capture evidence and send it in again a mobile makes that you know it's a lot more convenient than carrying around your laptop especially if you're a bricklayer or uh, bizarrely we were talking about plaiting horse's hair um, presumably still attached to the horse so again you know setting up your laptop isn't ideal but you know an, a phone and a baked bean tin on a wall somewhere it, it's it's possible and and the videos themselves are pretty short i mean i don't think any video is longer than five minutes and we we cover a number of areas but you did dedicate two videos to sound and you mentioned in that introduction there that sound was the most important element I mean, why what why why is that i mean pretty pictures big screens <laughs> yeah high, high definition 4k i mean that's that's all the buzzwords when i go into like a tv shop well i and you know we've all had that experience i mean like i'm i'm old enough to remember postage stamp size video on the internet you know low quality dial up and and and, and i suppose there was a novelty factor I remember trying to download the the, mission, the new Mission Impossible trailer once, and and I think we went out, had dinner, watched the actual film, got home, and it still hadn't downloaded. And then even when it did, the quality was was shocking. But but audio has a much lower bandwidth, so the audio was was okay. The the video was 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 not good. But but you stick with it. And, and and I think, you know, even in, you know, this this sort of age of, of digital TV, it's not uncommon to get glitches and whatnot. But if the sound is good, you'll you'll stick with it because that's that's where the sense making part of it comes in. All the all the, the nice pictures in the world are, are great. But if there's nothing, there's no audio, whether it's sound effect or a voiceover, you know, a narrative that, that's explaining to you what's what's happening, how you're supposed to make sense of this, then you very quickly switch off. And typically I'm helping people make videos for the web and for social media. So you're dealing with a completely different sort of sensibility in terms of how long people will give you to uh, to engage. You know, in a cinema, it's fine. You've probably got a good 15, 20 minutes before somebody decides I've had enough. I'm walking out. And even then they've paid. So, you know, they, they really want to stay there. They really want to be entertained. But on a phone or even on a laptop, if they're watching a video, you've got to engage them immediately. Otherwise, there's the promise of something better, just a few centimeters away, just a swipe of the phone. So if you've got it, you know, presumably you've spent ages crafting uh, an amazing story that's going to engage people. And if they can't hear it, then it's it's wasted so audio is is 
crucial. Um, people always say it's like half of your movie. And uh, the question is how much, you know, you could argue 75%, 80%, you know, it's, it's a lion's share because everything else is, is worthless without it. You do, you do dedicate one of the videos to lighting. <clears throat> now, obviously here in Scotland, we're blessed with eternal sunshine and you know, that's not really a problem, but on those odd occasional days, um, I did see this one video from the States where a guy had taped like literally gaffer taped um his his phone onto a window and he was he was standing talking to it and he was delivering his presentations that way and obviously we can do that too because we've yeah. got just as much sun you know as they do <clears throat> but <laughs> so light what what i mean do i need fancy spotlights do i need do i need to bring in uh, well to, to yeah to some degree i mean i suppose that it's it's how you use the light is which is the crucial thing so um Lap laptops to some degree, phones definitely are these days are, are very good at adapting to low light conditions. So, you know, just use your phone in at uh, dusk and you'll see that it, it's a completely different picture to what you can even see with, with your eyes. Um, the, 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 the big sort of error that people typically make is that they sit there with their back to a window and that, that just makes your phone work harder because it's trying to balance between the bright light in the background, even if it's not bright sunshine, just the contrast between you unlit and and that wind and that light coming uh, behind you. So, yeah, so so in a lot of cases, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to gaffer tape my phone to anything. Um, but, you know, that's so but definitely just sitting in front of a window. If you if your desk is in front of a window, then chances are you're going to be nicely, evenly lit. And, and actually w what we are blessed with, I mean, people in California and Australia, uh, their challenge is direct sunlight. So they have to shut the curtains and then light their room in a, in a complete different way because it just bleaches everything out. So so we, we're blessed with cloud cover that gives you a nice even light, which is a lot easier to work with. Um, but, you know, today, the way my desk is arranged, I've got light coming in from, from here. Um, but in order for you to see me clearly, I'm using two lights. So I've got my little mobile light, which if I turn it off, then it's not too bad, but because I've got my key light to the to my right, then it puts the, the where the, the light the light isn't directly coming through the window. So I mean this is this is doable, but if I turn this light off, then it's it's not so good because the, the rest of the room is nice and evenly lit from the natural light coming through the room. So you know, for, for 20, 30 pounds, you can get a couple of nice lights that will make all the difference. And, um, and again, it just, you, you have to work that online. You have to, I think you have to work that a little bit harder with your body language and, and communication. So, um, if people can't see you, then a lot of that is, is lost. So yeah, it, it is important. To be, to be fair, <clears throat> I did go out and buy a light, although I, I may have bought it for for seven pounds at a discount store, which I'm sure is available. And I'm sure it'll last for ages, Kenji. So that's good value. Oh, so another point, um, and, and from what I can see of you online here as well, you talk about in the videos about standing up. Now I've, I've, I've seen a few people do this when they're they're presenting. Do you, do you find that standing makes a difference? Or are you, do you have your setup just now on that stool? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I am. Um, I can get up and walk about. And if so, this is a little bit different. We're just having a chat. So this is probably um, I'm, I'm in chat mode. But if I'm in presenter mode, then I have to get up and walk about. And 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 again, I think it just makes it. If I sit down, I go into almost audience mode, and and I can feel myself boring myself, let alone anybody else. So if I can feel myself falling asleep, then, you know, I can't expect anybody else to stick with it. So for me, and I, I, I don't know, I, I'm used to, I, you know, up until lockdown, I was used to being in a room and um, usually with people I've, I've, I'm meeting for the first time. So 
and and I'm actually an introvert. So part of my, you know, I take on a character really. Um, and part of that is just getting up and moving around. If I was to sit down, I would just feel like, you know, I suppose they, they say a moving target is harder to hit. So there's there's maybe an element of that. It's survival. Um, I also present near the door as well. So I've got, you know, close to the exits. So it just makes me it makes me feel more comfortable. And, you know, ultimately your audience feel the more comfortable you look and are, the more comfortable they are. Nobody wants to sit and watch, you know, a car crash presentation or, or or interview you know it's the same when I'm when I'm teaching people about filmmaking and doing interviews you know half of your job forget all the tech stuff half your job is to get the person in front of the camera comfortable because if they look uncomfortable then the audience feel uncomfortable and and you know they're more likely again to switch off because it's just like too horrible to to watch so uh, you know so then the same applies I always get sort of film students in front of the camera because they have to know, you know, most of them, the last thing they want to, you know, they're, they're doing filmmaking because they, they're happy behind the camera. But you have to get in front of it to, to experience that. And it's the same with presenting. The more comfortable you are, the more comfortable everybody else is. And you, you bring up students there. And one of our videos focuses in part on that idea of collecting evidence. So more and more as we're working remotely, it's the idea of getting students comfortable with the idea of filming themselves and presenting that evidence uh, for, for assessment purposes. And, and that's I, I think that's a point that's often overlooked in the focus on getting lecturers just in front of a camera and, and doing the teaching. So what about the students? Do you feel students are more, less confident about the same in terms of how they feel about being on a camera? Um, I suppose I suppose it depends on the individual. What I, what I do know, what I picked up intuitively, and um, and this is going back to I, I did a I, I did a project down in uh, in London, documenting a, uh, a, a a company that ran hostels, homeless hospital hostels. And so I, so one, I couldn't have, I wasn't supposed to have people on camera. It was supposed to be anonymous. So it was mostly capturing body language and, and whatnot. And for the first time I was using mobile devices to do everything. And even then I noticed, so this, like I say, since 2012, I noticed that people were a lot more comfortable and were able to ignore the camera in a way that I hadn't noticed with bigger sort of more professional looking cameras so and, and and actually a few years later there was actually a study done and, and people were saying you know this that people are more comfortable in front of an iPhone uh, like in front of a phone and and partly that's because they had phones by then and and were just comfortable using their own phone and there and and being you know having photos taken and all that kind of stuff um so, so one of the benefits for me as a mobile filmmaker, you know, wanting to capture stories and, and sort of capture uh, authentic, you know, people authentically capture their authentic self and have them not go into sort of interview mode or, or some kind of take on some alternate personality to tell their story um, using a mobile device was a, was a huge benefit. So I think the same is true when you're, you know, People and and, and 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 I suppose the younger you go down the scale, the more people are used to capturing themselves for all sorts of reasons, whether it's social media or FaceTime. Um, and so and, and we're used to kind of seeing that little picture of ourselves in a way that previous generations weren't. So there's there's definitely, you know, some of that just getting used to it because I mean, nobody I don't think there's anybody sort of wakes up in the morning desperate to get on camera. Um, but then people who do it for a living just get used to it. And, and I've definitely improved over the last 18 months because you've had this concentrated diet of just being on camera. So you learn to sort of notice the ticks that you do. You notice, you know, things that you, you're sort of self-editing and, and just improving. So I think when it comes to capturing evidence, you know, and especially when it's something that's practical, um, and and you are remote, then what better way? And 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 the, the barriers are, are down, like I said, because we've got used to doing it. We're using that technology more. Um, a lot of young people are already using editing uh, apps 
for, for lots of other things. Um, and again, probably, you know, really inconsequential things, you know, bits of social media um, or holiday videos. So why not bring it into an area where actually you can use it for something really useful? Um, and it's going to, you know, there have already been a couple of studies over the last few years by Scottish government and um, another big organization that I can't remember the name of. But, you know, digital, so, you know, digital skills across the board, really important, but creative digital skills, you know, even more so, because these are the things that are, are less likely to be automated, and especially in the short term. I mean, there are a couple of uh, AI companies that are developing sort of AI graphic design, um, there are sort of AI video apps that will recognize activity, um, but still it, we're, we're decades away from an AI movie, for example, because it's a creative process. Um, so, you know, it's, these, are, these are skills that really should be, to my mind, primary school, because actually the, 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 I, I, ran a, I ran a summer school a couple of summers ago and um, uh, the co I, I designed a course and it was not, you know, the, the courses I, I do are pretty standard. Um, it's all about sort of putting it in the context. And so I ran it with a, a group of 10 year olds in Perth and they'd completed a three day course in two days. And for adults, there's a lot of barriers. It's like, oh, I don't know whether I want to learn this new app, um, getting very precious about stuff, whereas the kids just get into it and they were using sort of industry standard software to create little videos. Um, so it should be, it should start there because it's a, it's a lifelong skill and has all sorts of applications for, for work and for pleasure. I, I think you're true. I, I mean, what you say is true because now more and more in the workplace that the idea of like taking your car for a service uh, <laughs> when it's done you, you get a video <laughs> from the yeah. guy explaining what they've done and you know for me 20 years ago 10, 15 years ago i've never thought that would have happened um but more and more video just comes part of life and in in that video when you're working with the students and talking about evidence you know you get some really useful tips some practical tips just about the kind of things you need to include and and how you get everything into shot and and some useful sort of technological sort of aspects of working with longer period um takes where you don't have to you can't send an hour's worth of video because you use time lapse i think time -lapse, in, yeah. in one in one example so the, there's lots of useful tips that you've packed in to such a short amount of time now <clears throat> talking of time we're running out of time so only got a couple of minutes but um i'm going to well first of all anyone in the room got a question for john is there and then like you know take advantage of his expertise here give him something and, and he loves tough questions can i just say that what's the, he really likes to be challenged. yeah because we can just edit them out that's yeah, well, the beauty that's of video <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask you a question. So um, I, I'm not a lecturer. I never have been. But uh, I was wondering if you had sort of a few top tips from a, a lecturer's point of view, if they're doing a bit of blended learning in that they have students in front of them, but they're also recording for students to look at a, a watch at a later date. They're not going to have professional lighting. They may have professional sound equipment and decent recording equipment. But in terms of lighting and big stage what would be your your top tips for them so again i think it's it's about um because when we talk about light i'm um, so the, the lights i'm using just now are they're, they're for the purpose of of this kind of work but equally you know a household lamp you know as long as you've got a light source it might make it might turn you a, a funny shade and and depending on your laptop you might not be able to do anything about that but the 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 key thing is that people can see you and they can hear you um a microphone in in the sound one we go through a whole range of of microphones from practically free to about a hundred pounds is the ceiling. Uh, so the mic I'm using is about a hundred pounds. But if I was to plug in, I can't see them here, but if I was to plug in my earbuds that came with uh, my phone, then absolute really good quality because that's, that's exactly what they're designed for. They've got the mic built into the cable. So even that is better than, than not having anything. Um, you know, depending on the laptop, 
the the software that neutralizes any sort of feedback loops and stuff will will vary and we've all been on calls where everybody has to be on mute and you can only have one mic on at a time otherwise you get a nasty echo so so those are the kind of things that r make it really hard work so being on screen is hard work for a start but if you've got to work harder to see people and understand people through visual cues and, and audio then those are things that need to be got out of the way first but the other thing so i mean I, i'm not a lecturer either but i do do a lot of workshops and one of the things i find really helpful about delivering online is that i can record the session so if i'm doing if i'm doing a two-hour workshop and it's for an organization it needs to be two hours because they will have other things booked in so the the fallback is right I'm, I'm going to do a demo now of how to edit on your phone. They will see my phone on the screen and we'll go through step by step. There's every chance that somebody will have to answer a phone or take that Amazon order or whatever, lose their place. I don't have to stop and redo. I just say you'll get the in a couple of hours you'll get the video so and it'll be chaptered so I, you know if there are any th parts that you need to refresh your memory on then you'll have access to that for the next week or two um, so there's so there's huge benefits because in the room that would be a lot harder to do uh, not impossible but but sort of difficult so yeah there are definitely benefits to to being online and um, and you know recording is, is one of them but. Again, going back to the techie stuff, like improvise, you know, be creative or do find the shop that Kenji goes to to get some really cheap lights. Thanks, John. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so we've we've reached the end uh, of our session. Time's the one thing we just can't work around. Um, John, look, I really appreciate you taking the time. If everyone else, um, I'll put the link to the playlist for the videos down below, um, and please catch up with that. Uh, the, the videos are great. The nice, informal style, very short, but just packed with good information. So if you have the time, give them a watch. Okay, thanks for joining us today um, at the Virtual Bridge session. Hope to see you again at future session, but until then, as always, stay safe.